right. Good morning. <laughs> Love it. Hey, uh, we are in week four of our homecoming series. As you've noticed, there's a little bit of energy around campus. There's delicious food. Uh, there's a lot of fun, fun things going on. If you've been here more than one service, you know what we're about this morning. Um, but if you were here last week, you were given some homework uh, by me at the end of the service. And I told you guys, I said, hey, uh, maybe there's some of you that have been considering getting baptized. Maybe there's some of you that have been considering going all in with Jesus. And my hope, my prayer uh, for the last week has been that you guys took that seriously. And maybe you thought about it. Maybe you prayed about it. And maybe you made a decision. Um, you know, and that, that's our hope because that's what today's all about. Today's all about celebrating. Today's all about um, being and, and, and enjoying. Man, just celebrating with the people around us and our friends. Like, as you can see, it looks like there's a bunch of people missing today, but that's because there's a bunch of people that are not sitting in here, but they're sitting in the main auditorium because later today, uh, man, they get to make the best decision you can make with your entire life. And that is them going all in for Jesus. And that's what I want to chat about. Yeah, that's fine. We can give it up for that. There'll be plenty of clapping later. So save your hands. Um, but yeah, I want to chat about the idea of, of great party. So let me remind you of the scene that we're in. So we're in Luke 15. And we have Jesus, and he is hanging out at the table with a bunch of dirty, good-for-nothing sinners, according to the elites of the day. So the elites of the day, they know, they, know all, they know the Bible back and forth. They know the rules. They know the regulations. They're in charge of everything, the, the social order, the economic order. They call all the shots. And so for all intents and purposes, they should get to say who is worthy and who is not. And so they're looking at Jesus and they're looking at him hanging out with all these tax collectors and prostitutes and lepers and, and all kinds of people that they deem less than. And they look at Jesus and they say, if you're the son of God, if you're this, this high priest that you're supposed to be, why are you hanging out with these people? That makes no sense. They are dirty. They're at the bottom of the social ladder. They don't follow the commandments and the law. So why are you with them, Jesus? But if you're not familiar with Jesus, if you're not familiar with the Jesus that I serve and the Jesus that we believe in here, Jesus was in the nature of taking the way that we so often view the world and actually flipping it upside down and looking at people that the world would say are less than or not worthy of and actually calling them chosen and enough and worthy of him dying on the cross for. And that's what Jesus is communicating through this. So I wanna talk about this party that, that, that heaven says that happens every time a lost person comes home. But to illustrate that, I want to talk about one of the biggest parties that our world sees every year. So if you're not familiar with the Oscars, so the Oscars are, are, this, are this time every year where like all these celebrities and famous people, actors, the best Spider-Man that ever played Spider-Man, um, and all these like famous people come together and it, you got actors, you got directors, you got music composers, you got extras, you got all kinds of people. And they wear these fancy dresses and tuxedos and they get together for a night of celebrating what's going on in pop culture, best movie, best score, all this other stuff. But there's also a part of the Oscars that so often doesn't get featured that I actually found out about this week. It, did you guys know that at the Oscars, just for attending, you actually get like a goodie bag? It's like a, like a bag like you would get at a little kid's birthday party or maybe some of your birthday parties. Like just for attending, here's a bag of candy. Here's a bag of, of you know, trinkets and whatever. I just took Maverick to his first ever two-year-old uh, party for a two-year-old. And in the goodie bag, they uh, gave him a bunch of candy and a whistle. And I looked at him and I said, why? Why would you give a two-year-old a whistle? Like as a parent, I hate you for that. But thank you for taking care of my son. Um, but at the Oscars, they give everybody these goodie bags. Now, does anybody want to take a stab at the value of the goodie bags? Like when you, when you add up everything in the bag, somebody just 10 K $5, 2000. Anybody else? $5, $20. Nope. Nope. The value of one goodie bag from the Oscars is 160 to $200,000. Just for one goodie bag, bro. Like, can I get an invite for like 
world's okayest youth pastor. Like, I don't got to win anything. I can just take the goodie bag. And so here's what you'll find in an Oscars goodie bag. You'll find extravagant vacations to Sweden. You'll find spa visits. You'll find designer clothes, accessories, cold, hard cash, collectibles, all kinds of stuff that are just given to these people that are already rich anyway. So why can't I have a spa vacation, you know? So I don't know about you guys, but... But like, I wouldn't necessarily scoff at an invite to the Oscars. I wouldn't necessarily scoff at an invite to to one of the best parties around. But even with something as cool as this, God actually invites us to an even better party. And today I kind of want to talk about that a little bit. There's a story Emily covered a few weeks ago. It was called the story of the prodigal son. And you have this son and and he gets into some trouble when he leaves um, his dad's house. So let's check this out. You can go to, the, to Luke uh, 15, verses 11 through 16. It says this. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had. He set up for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine that shook the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill the stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So this story, if you're not familiar with the Bible, man, it's got everything you could ever want to make a really, really good Hallmark like docu-series. So you got, you got family drama, you got betrayal, you got jealousy, you got redemption, you got all the things that make a good story. And we have this younger brother who essentially looks at his dad and he says, dad, I wish you were dead. Like, I wish that you didn't exist on planet Earth anymore. Because the custom is when dad dies, his money, his inherit, uh, everything that he's worth, his land, his livestock, his cash, his jewels, everything gets divided between these two sons. But that doesn't happen until dad dies. And so the son is going to his dad and saying, hey, just give me my money now. Instead of having to wait until you die, just give it to me now. Yeah, I know. We're all doing it. Um, so just give me, give me my inheritance now. So what that communicates to the dad is, I don't actually care about you anymore. I just want your money because I think I can do life by myself a lot better. And so we see what he does with it. He blows it all. He goes off to a far country, and the Bible says all kinds of wild living. And so he hits rock bottom, and he's so low that he's actually sitting there at a farm, and he's feeding these pigs this slop. Like, I don't want you to think about, like, oh, he's feeding animals, so he's, like, giving them kibble. No, we're talking, like, rotting, sloppy, sludgy food that he's giving these pigs. And he's so hungry, he's so far down in the pit that he looks at this trough of nastiness, and he thinks to himself, maybe I can steal a scoop for myself. Maybe I can get just a little bit for myself because I'm so hungry. And that looks good. This is rock bottom. Now, some of you probably know what a rock bottom looks like for you because you've experienced it. Rock bottom for you might have looked a lot of different ways. Rock bottom for me was sitting there and wondering when enough was enough. And and then looking at myself in the mirror and naturally not recognizing the person that looked back at me. And wondering where, where, where did I go wrong? Where, where did I make the bad choice that led me to this, this place? But then for some of you, you're actually the complete opposite. You don't know what rock bottom looks like because you have always made the right choice and you've always said yes and you've always followed the rules and your idea of rock bottom is a story that you heard in the locker room at school or, or maybe something you saw on TV or, or, or something along those lines. And here's the tricky part is, a lot of the times when we think that way, we don't realize that it this paints a picture of us versus them. It paints a picture like I have it figured out and those sinners over there, they, they actually don't know. But if I can be so bold as to say that actually every single one of us, despite about what your rock bottom may look like, are the younger brother in this story the brother that looked at his father and, and, and said, I actually don't need you. I'm, I'm actually good on my own. Because so many times in life, we, we look at God and, and we think, I can actually go about it by myself. I don't actually need you here. 
Because we look at God and we say, God, um, we, we want by what you can give us, but we don't want you. We want the blessing, but we don't want the submission that comes along with going after God. We say, God, can you, God, can you heal this? God, can you fix the financial situation? God, can you stop my parents from getting a divorce? God, can you heal my grandma from her cancer? God, can you give me the grades I need? God, can you help me make the team? Can you help me get those friends? Can you help me be in this, out of this situation that I don't want to be in? But I actually, but I'm not going to do whatever you asked me to do. Can you just do these things for me, but, but, but don't ask me to do anything back? And that's so often the way we treat our conversations with the Lord. It's like a one-way phone call. We, we pick up the phone, we dial the number, we tell God everything we need, and then before he ever gets to say a word back to us, we hang up. Because it's about me and it's not about you. We want what he can give us, but we don't want the submission that goes along with it. So the younger brother, after doing just that with his daddy, comes up with a plan. He says, I'm going to go and I'm going to apologize. And I'm going to say, Dad, I am so sorry would you just make me a slave in your, in your kingdom? Would you just make me a servant in your kingdom? Because if I can do that, then at least I'm gonna get food and I'm gonna have a roof over my head. And so that's where we're gonna pick up. He knows that it's a bit a big of a ask to ask his dad. So he runs to his dad, Luke 15, verses 20 to 24. So he returned home to his father. I don't know, he was still a long way off. His father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. And his son said, here's the apology, Father, I sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, quickly, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring and put it on his finger, sandals and put him on his feet, and kill the fattened calf. We must celebrate with a feast, for the son of mine was dead and is now returned to life. He was lost but now he has found, so the party began. Now, by now, you probably understand your place and my place in the story. He, he, you and I are not the father. You and I are the son that chose to walk away. You and I are, are, are the son that, that thought he or she knew better than the father, and, and God is the father. And if there's one thing I love about God from this story and the other parables we covered is that God loves to celebrate when somebody that has lost come home, comes home. Much like the father celebrates when the, when the son comes over to him and, and he wants to be reunited with him, that's how God treats people that walk away from him and come back. And I don't know what your relationship with God looks like today. I don't know who you think God is. I don't know how you feel like God is going to welcome you or address you whenever you finally decide to stop living for yourself and start living for him. Maybe somebody told you that God is done with you. Maybe somebody told you that, that, that there's no hope for you, that you've gone too far and that that grace doesn't extend. But can I tell you that that's not what the Bible teaches, and especially in the in these stories, we saw three different parables of what happens when something that was gone is found. And in the first one, we have a, a shepherd and he's got a sheep and the sheep chooses to wander away from the shepherd. The, chief, the, the sheep chooses to go chase a different life than the life that the shepherd has for it. And when the sheep is lost, the shepherd leaves the 99 and he goes after the one and he finds that sheep and he puts it on his shoulders and he brings it home. And then when he brings it home, he celebrates and he throws a party because of his one sheep that was lost. And then we have a lady who's looking for a coin, a coin that, that to us, it might just be like, man, it's just a coin. But she flips her whole house upside down until she finds this coin. And when she finds the coin, she doesn't yell at the coin. She doesn't tell the coin, how dare you get lost. She looks at the coin and she celebrates that this lost coin is home. And then we have a beautiful picture of a father and his son, and his son runs to the father after, after turning away from him for all intents and purposes, and he's got this big, long, drawn-out apology ready for him, and the dad looks at him, and he says, hey, stop. You don't actually have to apologize. You don't actually have to, have to feel bad about yourself. You don't actually have to continue living in shame and, and coming and asking to be my, my employee. No, no, no. You actually are restored to sonship. I actually adopt you back into the family. I love you. You can come home. 
The dad doesn't sit there and scold his son. He welcomes him with wide open arms. And in all three of them, there is a party that is had. And that is a beautiful picture of what we get to witness today because there are already well over 100 people that have made a choice today and on Thursday to be baptized and to give up a life of living life for themselves. And my question is, could that possibly be you today? My question is like, maybe, maybe you're sitting here and you tuned out this message and you won't stop talking to your friends in the back row because you've already been baptized and you think, well, this doesn't apply to me. So I'm just going to go ahead and tune out. Or maybe for you, you're sitting there and you're thinking, man, I actually have been debating about doing this for a long time now. And I've been debating about actually going all in with Jesus. Like I know who Jesus is. I, I believe that there's a creator out there, but I just don't know if this is the right next step for me. And my ask of you is, would you listen to these questions and would you listen to these answers and allow them to paint a full picture for you? Some of you are familiar with baptism. You've been there before, but some of you have kicked around the idea for way too long. A while ago, you said, yeah, I want to get baptized. And then life happened and you just didn't do it. Some of you, you decided, man, I want to get baptized. Some of you woke up this morning and you came in and you were like, I'm just going to church. Maybe there's something different in store for you. But my hope is this. I am not here to lie to you. I am not here to coerce you into doing something you don't want to do. That is not my job. If there's one thing I hate is emotional manipulation, and that's not what I'm going to do for you today. My hope is that I can at least remove some roadblocks that maybe you've been placing in front of your life for a little bit too long, and that maybe I can clear up some questions that you might have came up with along the way. So first question that we usually ask is, why baptism? Like, why, why should I get baptized? Man, it's actually a pretty simple answer. It's because Jesus commanded it and because Jesus emulated it. Jesus himself got baptized. In, in, in the Great Commission, he says, go out and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus doesn't say, go out and like, tell people about Jesus and then like, walk away and go home and watch football. Like Jesus says, like, go out and make disciples and then baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So like the work doesn't stop at telling somebody, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, and then walking away. Like that's not where the work stops, that's where the work begins. Not only that, but Jesus actually himself goes into the waters and gets baptized by John the Baptist, and he shows us this. So why? Well, because if you're a Christian and you call yourself a believer today, your goal, and I, I know my goal, is to look more like Jesus. So why wouldn't I do something that he did? Like, if he did it, then I should probably do it too. And the next question sometimes we ask is like, okay, oh, I, I want to get baptized. I just don't know when. When, when should I get baptized? Like, what, what's the rule here? I know some people wonder this. And, and in the Bible, we actually have a story that lays it out pretty clearly. In Acts 18.8, it says, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul became believers and were baptized. There's your answer pretty clear right there. It says that they believed in Jesus. They believed in the Lord first, and then they were baptized. And people often wonder like, well, like, uh, like I believe, but I, I just don't know if right now is the right time. Like I, my grandma isn't here. She lives in, in, in Sweden and like we have to book a fly and, and I have all these excuses that my best friend is on an on a Alaskan cruise and I really wanted her here. Can I just tell you that like there is a sense of urgency to this that Jesus literally speaks on in the Bible. For example, look at the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, right? Like you, if you're not familiar with the story, Philip is walking down the road and you have this, this, this uh, court, this guy that works in the court of the queen and he's sitting there and he's reading from this massive scroll, but he doesn't understand what he's reading. He doesn't understand the word of God. And so Philip walks up and he's like, hey, what are you reading? And essentially in layman's terms, he says, I'm reading the Bible. And Philip says, do you actually understand understand what you're reading? And he's like, I don't. Can you explain it to me? And he says, yeah, I can tell you exactly what that says. And he tells him exactly what's in there. And then the eunuch believes in Jesus in that moment. And he says, now I have to get baptized. And Philip says, okay, when do you want to do it? And he looks at Philip and he says, there's a river. What about that one right there? Like 
guys, like the Bible illustrates, like believe, and then as soon as you believe, get baptized. And it's not because that's the only, that like you have to get baptized and you, and you need to, it's because Jesus commands it. Jesus says like, man, like what, why wouldn't you? I did it. And then the last question is, do I have to? And I think this question often comes from a sense of pride almost, where it's like, ah, you know what? I don't actually think I have to get baptized, Juan. I, I think that as long as I'm a good person and as long as I believe in Jesus, that I'm good. I don't actually have to get baptized. And I think that that, like, you're asking the wrong question. I would answer you if that's you today and you're saying why I don't think so, I would ask you a question that you need to ask yourself. And you don't have to answer it to me, but I need you to answer it to yourself. And that question is this, why do you feel like you shouldn't have to do something that Jesus himself chose to do? If you're a believer and you haven't taken that step and you don't feel like you have to, why? Why do you feel like you know better than Jesus does? I'm not asking that question to guilt you. I'm just asking that question to force you to really think about what is holding you back? What is this roadblock in the way? So I want to finish this morning. I want to talk to two of you that are sitting in this room. Some of you have already made this choice. Some of you got baptized a long time ago, a few months ago, a couple minutes ago. And I am so grateful for you and I'm so proud of you, and you made the best choice you could have ever made. Better than a career you will one day be in, better than the person you choose to marry or not marry one day, better than any decision you make in your entire life. You already made that choice, and that is amazing, and that is worth celebrating, and I am thankful to be in the family with you, man. And then I wanna to talk to those of you that have been wondering about this. And maybe you're sitting and you're like, Juan, I just don't think today's the day. Like I've been thinking about it, but today just doesn't feel like it. I didn't have it. I didn't have it planned. I, I, didn't, I didn't wear the right clothes. I, I didn't do this and that. It just, it wasn't in the cards today for me, but can I just maybe f ask you to think a different way? And it might've not been in the cards for you, but I think God had this date circled on the calendar for you way before you knew it was even a thing. But, but what about my parents? Man, we live in an age where technology is amazing and all of you have a mini computer in your phones where you, or, where you can text them or call them and say, hey, today's the day, mom and dad. Or maybe for you, it's, it's man, I don't, I don't have the right clothes. I didn't bring my swimsuit. Hey, we got t-shirts, we got shorts, we got towels, we got underwear, we got whatever you need to get baptized today. Oh, but, but like, I don't want, like my hair looks good. No, it doesn't, it, it looks fine, I guess. <laughs> Or for some, for some of you ladies, you're like, Juan, but I did my makeup today and I usually don't do my makeup on Sundays. I'll help you put your makeup on after you come out of the water. I'm amazing at doing makeup. Like whatever it takes to get you to make a choice that you've been kicking the can on for months and months and months, like we will bend over backwards. We will pull out all the stops so that you can take the jump that you've been dreaming and thinking about taking and, and being confused about. Juan, I don't know enough. You all you need to know is that Jesus loves you and that Jesus cares about you and that Jesus invites you to live a life that is so much better than life on your own. And if you can look me in the eye and you can look yourself in the eye and believe that and confess that with your heart, then you know enough. That is all you need. You don't need to sit through a class. You can make that choice right now. And here in a second, we're gonna wrap up. I'm gonna close up. The band's gonna play one more song. And then we're gonna get up and we're gonna walk over there and we're gonna go and watch a lot of our friends and a lot of our family get baptized. It's gonna be an amazing moment. But what I wanna encourage you to do is this. Man, if that's you and you're sitting there and you're like, I wasn't ready, but I think I'm supposed to. During this song, man, would you go out into the lobby and find Emily? And would you have a conversation with her? Because we can get you ready. And if you are getting baptized during this service, during the song as well for you, you can go out and you can head down and, and start getting ready for baptisms. But can I just tell you one more time, why not you? 
Why not today? Why are you still waiting? Why are you still making excuses? Let me pray for us.